Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and all of God's creatures. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. This week, Rachel's got preaching insights for you for June 13th, 2021. But as she is wont to do, Rachel's going to take us on a little side trip, eh? Well, sort of. So now we're entering into that really interesting time of year when different denominations consider different texts as the alternate first reading. Mm. So so some traditions, I think the Presbyterian Church tends to follow the semi-consecutive reading and consider that one to be the main reading, while the Old Testament text that's matched to the gospel is considered the alternate. But I've, I've found this flipped scenario in most Lutheran churches, where the first reading that is matched to the gospel is typically chosen, while the semi-continuous reading is considered alternate. Hmm. That could be confusing, but I think most churches just preach the New Testament. Yeah, exactly. Fair. Totally fair. <laughs> so, so, and that's true, because the problem is only a problem if you happen to be hosting a podcast called First Reading, and you can't quite dis- determine what the first reading is supposed to be. That's right. The 1.5 reading, is that what <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. So the moral of this whole story is this may be a side jaunt into the alternate first reading, or it may be the one that is in your celebrate insert, if you're a particular kind of Lutheran. All that to say, we're going to be looking today at the reading from Ezekiel 17, verses 22 to 24. If you're in the mood for an excellent exploration of 1 Samuel 15 to 16, do a little search for that text on our website and check out what Tim had to say about preaching this text backwards a little while ago. Yeah, we've got an episode on that passage too, don't we? We do, Mm -hmm. we do. But as for me and my exegesis, I got fascinated by Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel 17. What's so fascinating about that? Well, first off, this is, it's itty bitty. So that in and of itself was just kind of interesting. Like (laughs) how might you preach an entire sermon on, you know, two to four verses? Uh, But secondly, it's just a beautiful text for summertime. It describes planting a tender twig, a shoot that brings forth boughs and produces branches and grows into a noble tomato plant, uh, cedar. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you've got the craving for that first tomato of the summer, don't you? Yeah, 100% I do. So this is not, in fact, a noble tomato plant, but you get the idea. All of us are kind of in the mood for a little summer gardening, or at least for thinking romantically about possibly someday doing a little summer gardening, Maybe which is my favorite, w- my favorite <laughs> way to garden. Exactly. So right off the bat, this text kind of hits the spots. And preacher friends, if you wanted, you could take that idea and run with it. I mean, I could see a beautiful sermon about what God is growing in you at this season of your life. What is God growing in your congregation? What is God growing in us as a nation? I recently heard a podcast on one person's intentional effort to notice delight in their life. It wasn't like the search for happiness that consumes so many Americans, but it it was more the concept that what you look for in life, you tend to find. The more this person noticed delight, the more they became aware of its presence in their lives. So maybe challenge your parishioners to put seven sticky notes on their bathroom mirror. And at the end of the day for that week, while they're brushing their teeth, ask them to write down one thing they noticed God growing in them that day. That sounds very practical and really helpful. But that can't be the only reason that this text grabbed you. No, but I do love putting sticky notes on a bathroom mirror. I just think it's a fun thing to do. Here's the part that really did suck me in. In trying to figure out what was going on with this text, I went back to the beginning of the pericope, which is really a fancy word to just say text chunk. And um, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar with this, but just in case you're not, Bible passages, especially in the prophets, tend to come in small chunks that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They're related to the larger chunks of text around them, but they have a sort of unity in Mm -hmm. and of themselves. So if you're dropped into the middle of one like this and you want to understand it better, you go back until you find the beginning of that particular text chunk. And sometimes that's the chapter mark and sometimes it's not. Here it does happen to be. And we know this because of the phrase, the word of the Lord came to me in chapter 17, verse 1. So what we find then over the course of this chapter is a fascinating image of an eagle who is not an eagle who plucks a branch that is not a branch. The eagle is an allegory for God, 
The branch is an allegory for Israel. So this gardener eagle plucks a branch off of a tree in Lebanon and plants it, expecting the tree to serve as his nesting place. But what do you think happens in this allegory, Tim? Hmm. The tree likes another eagle better? Yeah, exactly. So it's, so it's kind of a strange allegory. But if you continue with it, the tree does not remain under the first eagle that planted it, but instead sends out its twigs towards another eagle, which in the allegory is another deity or nation. So as I said before, allegory for Israel and Judah's tendency to abandon God and follow other deities. And if you've been paying attention to your Bible, you know what's going to happen in this allegory. The first eagle gets mad and tears down the vine and it falls into judgment, but a remnant of the vine is left that God will replant, which is where our text, Pericope, picks up for today. But here's where it gets interesting. When God replants the vine in our text, there's a different result that occurs. So when the first planting happened back at the beginning of the chapter, what was the purpose of the vine tree again, Tim? To be a nesting place for the eagle. Right, exactly. But here, what happens in verse 23 is something slightly different. God says, I will plant the twig on the mountain height of Israel in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit so that every kind of bird will live in it and nest in its branches. So there's this shift. God now has bigger plans for this twig. It's not just meant to be a nesting place for the deity anymore, but it's meant to be a nesting place for all the birds of every kind. This new planting, this new tree, flourishes for the sake of those around it. And what caught me so much about that is it's almost like this beautiful idea that the vulnerable receiving a home is a better use of the divine throne than even as God's resting place. Mm -hmm. And I just think that could be a really beautiful sermon, this idea that God's intention for us is not just to worship, not just to be in relationship, but to become uh, branches that go out into the world and can be a resting place for those who are vulnerable. Yeah, and, and I think one of, the, one of the things about this whole image, metaphor, allegory thing that's going on here in the text is that this, this little twig that's been replanted is so, seems so insignificant. And yet it becomes such a, uh, an opportunity for so many different peoples to be able to nest. And that was sort of the, the hope for Ezekiel, right? That when, mm -hmm. when God replants the people in the land, that um, even though they seem insignificant, that they would become a kind of um, magnet for all yeah. the peoples of the world to be able to come and to experience the reality of, of their God, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like either God goes through a, a shift in the divine intentions of to be my nesting place and then to be something greater than that. Or there's this return to that promise in Genesis 12 that God mm -hmm. makes to Abraham that in you, all the families of the world shall be blessed. It's like this. It's like, remember, folks, this is the ultimate plan here. This is the ultimate goal and the ultimate mission to send you out in the world so that through you, all the families of the earth can be blessed. It's a really beautiful text that I think could be a really helpful reminder to folks in our pews of what this is all about. Yeah, it is sort of a full circle type of type of mm -hmm. passage, right? And mm -hmm. and that's exactly the way that Jesus picks up this this text to use it for a parable in Mark 4 where he talks mm -hmm. about the like the mustard seed or the little seed that grows up into a big bush so big that all of the birds can come and nest in it. Jesus has mm -hmm. this sort of same vision of what what he's doing as being uh, uh, coming back to that Genesis 12 promise that mm -hmm. that what God is doing in, in blessing this people is to make space for the whole world to be able to come into relationship with God. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, cool. Thanks uh, for giving us a little insight into this and, and especially for setting it in the con the wider context of the chapter. Because mm -hmm. you know how, how I don't like when we just take like two verses and make it do... <laughs> do whatever we want it to do. So seeing it in context is like the key to really getting the heart of, of this metaphor. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Awesome. Well, that's going to bring us to the end of our episode this week. Thanks everyone for giving us a listen. And if you find this helpful, then share this episode with all of your friends and relatives and neighbors. <laughs> 
And、uh, you know, all get, of them. Just go knock on their doors and be like, "Hey, I've got something for you." Yes, if if you want to be a door-to-door -door first reading salesman, <laughs> we would we would welcome that. Yes, <laughs> so that would that would be awesome. Um, in lieu of that, you can find episodes on our website, firstreadingpodcast.com, or just share us from、uh, Facebook, our Facebook page, with your your whole social network. All right. Well, we're looking forward to being with you again next week. Until then, I'm Tim McNinch, and I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching, folks.